Can you solve a poem? Sometimes it feels as if poems and puzzles have quite a lot in common. You're handed this text, probably written by someone you've never met, and of course it doesn't just say what it means. That wouldn't be very poetic. Instead, you've got to read it through and either go away with some general idea of what on earth it said, or else sit down and analyse it. Solve it, in some sense. That can take some time, so if you're not inclined or you've got an idea you want to check, with both poems and puzzles, you can often just have a peek at the answer. Look it up, find some analysis. Plenty of poems even handily come with introductions and notes and commentaries, where some seasoned academic is ready with all your answers. The poet tells you a story, and then the editor tells you what the story really was. Is that cheating? I mean, no. There aren't any rules here. But in some way, somebody else might be cheating you. Do you trust this person who's telling you what to think? You might see they have impressive credentials, qualifications. But what if the explanation, the solution they're giving you, just seems off? What if they're injecting far too much of themselves into what they're saying? What if what they're saying is kind of absurd? Suddenly you're not just trying to solve the puzzle, you're trying to solve the solution. Written in 1962, Vladimir Nabokov's Pale Fire is one of the best constructed literary puzzles of the 20th century. Every time you peel away a solution, you find there's yet another to be solved. There's misdirections, contradictions, clues hidden in anagrams, in word games, in dark hints and throwaway lines. But is there a solution? Is it all just a mess? Or can we actually solve pale fire? Perhaps the most important realisation that a reader has on their first reading is the fact that Palefire is a novel, albeit an oddly structured one, because that's not immediately evident. The book is split into four parts, a foreword, the poem, itself called Palefire, a lengthy commentary, which includes lots of cross-referencing to both the poem and itself, and an index. So from the outset, it appears like one of many volumes you might find in the poetry section of a bookshop. And indeed, the first paragraph does nothing to contradict this. But Palefire does have both overt and underlying narratives, and all four of these sections have something to add to them. The foreword introduces us to the premise of the novel. John Shade, a well-known and respected American poet, has recently died unexpectedly, having just completed a poem entitled Palefire. His rough manuscript has been procured by one Dr Charles Kinboat, his neighbour and fellow lecturer at the nearby university, who's volunteered to act as the editor and commentator. Kinboat therefore acts as our narrator in a sense. Aside from the poem itself, the rest of Palefire is in his voice. By the end of the foreword, we have a very clear impression of Kinboat as not particularly likeable. To be more specific, he comes across as an arrogant, controlling, paranoid, deluded narcissist who is rather unqualified to be editing this poem in the first place, yet is enraged at the idea of anyone else being involved. Kinboat intrudes on his own notes countless times throughout the novel, often completely breaking away from the poem to launch into a personal anecdote. These anecdotes, which aren't really in any sort of chronological order per se, provide the backbone of the underlying plot, so to speak. This is why we can call Pale Fire a novel. The book is far more focused on Kinboat's thoughts than the actual poem or its author. As well as characterising Kinboat as a not great person, the foreword also begins to build the feeling that he may not be the most reliable narrator. It's just that a few things he says don't quite seem to add up. In particular, the relationship between him and John Shade. Most of the foreword details Kinboat's experience of moving to New Y, meeting Shade, and the subsequent deep friendship that the two develop. But even within Kinboat's own comments, there seem to be inconsistencies regarding their relationship. Kinboat emphatically proclaims his closeness with Shade several times, and the language he uses makes them seem like soulmates. But he also states that they have only known each other for three months 
and never actually talk about what is going on in their lives. It seems like Kinboat is inflating their friendship significantly. So by now, we are curious about what Shade's perspective on all this was, how it might have been different. And that brings us nicely to Palefire, the poem. Palefire is a very good poem. It's a lovely autobiographical piece, which plays with some interesting themes and showcases several moments of genuine vulnerability from Shade. The details and imagery contained throughout probably deserve their own video. It definitely feels very tonally different to the introduction. A world apart, really. And notably, Shade doesn't mention Kinboat by name once. Fact is, whilst the poem gives a great insight into the life of John Shade and is a vital part of the novel, it has very little to do with what this essay is about, trying to make sense of the events in Kinboat's life. Therefore, we unfortunately won't be analysing it on the level it deserves today. Speaking of analysis, next up is the commentary. And here's where things shift, because it's not really a commentary on Pale Fire at all. The notes, although supposedly citing specific lines, are mostly entirely unrelated to the contents or themes of the poem itself. Instead, Kinboat picks out unimportant words and uses them as a thinly veiled framing device, an excuse to tangent into what he hoped the poem was going to be about, his own home country of Zembla. Kinboat tells many stories recounting the life of Zembla's last king, Charles Xavier, or as he's apparently dubbed, Charles the Beloved. In the wake of a recent revolution led by a group called The Shadows, we follow Xavier's escape from Zembla and subsequent journey to the US. This Zembla narrative is interspersed with more background on the months leading up to Shade's death, as well as discussing Kinboat's life at large. In a few of these extracts, we learn that Kinboat often told Shade these tales of Zembla during their walks, and believed that the great poem Shade was writing was about Charles Xavier. Finally, mixed in with these is a third narrative. This one follows the Zemblin revolutionary Gradus, a member of the Shadows who is sent to assassinate Xavier after his escape. All three of these stories converge at the event of Shade's death, when Gradus arrives in UI and accidentally shoots Shade while aiming for Kinboat. Kinboat reads the poem, is sad that it's not about him, then looks again and starts to see that perhaps there are some references to Zembla after all. Then finally, we have the index. Unlike one would expect, this section is going to be key to solving what's really going on here. But I doubt everyone will even skim it during their first read. So, at the end of all that, the reader is likely thinking that they are a bit confused. Hailfire certainly isn't what most people would expect going into it. While reading though, most people will have picked up on some key things that will be very important going forward, so those are good to establish now. The main one is the fact that Kinboat is clearly an unreliable narrator. Kinboat prefaces the poem by claiming that we should read it alongside his commentary because it cannot be understood without his analysis. This is quite obviously not true. The poem is completely understandable without Kinboat's input. And to be honest, I think if you did read them at the same time, then you would probably be even more confused, or worse, not be able to enjoy the poem for what it actually is. The fact he thinks it isn't understandable is a pretty clear sign that he doesn't actually understand it himself, which is confirmed when he starts reading into it allusions to Zembla that are clearly non-existent. There are no hidden references to Zembla in this poem. In fact, as previously mentioned, there is no kinboat in the poem. Full stop. So if Kinboat is not reliable when it comes to commentary, and appears deluded when it comes to his and Shade's friendship, what else might he be misleading us about? Well, there is the elephant in the palace. It becomes evident as the reader progresses through the commentary that Kinboat wants us to believe he and Charles Xavier are the same person. He narrates every detail of Xavier's life, knows all his thoughts, and any evidence to the contrary is destroyed when Grada shows up and he starts reflecting on his kingly past in first person. At some point though, it would probably cross the reader's mind that Kinboat might be either lying or deluded about being the King of Zembla, and that that entire narrative is a fabrication. It all seems too fantastical to be true, fits in too well with his inflated sense of ego. And Zembla itself doesn't really line up with the rest of the realistic setting portrayed. In fact, maybe Zembla isn't even a real place to begin with. <laughs>
This all seems like quite a colourful puzzle piece, so why don't we start with that? There's another reason for thinking that the Zemblin narrative might be false. There's another very plausible explanation for Shade's death, and the truth of it is right there in the text. One thing that you can generally do when you're trying to get the truth out of a text that you think might be untrustworthy is to pay lots of attention to the little throwaway comments. Big, high-flown ideas that are essential to Kinboat's story we need to doubt as possible fabrications. For those random observations and by-the-way statements that don't contribute anything to the overall story, those are the ones more likely to be true. So what can we glean about Shade's death from the side comments? We know Shade was murdered while walking up to Kinboat's house by a man standing on the porch. The murderer had just rung the doorbell, so it does appear he was out to kill the occupant of the house. But actually, we know the house doesn't belong to Kinboat. Kinboat is renting his house from a certain Judge Goldsworth. And not only that, he mentions that there are rumours of the terrifying shadows that Judge Goldsworth gowned through across the underworld or about this or that beast lying in prison and positively dying of their thirst for revenge. So we have some criminal condemned by this judge thirsting for revenge. And then just one page before that, Kimboat describes a photo album which contains a picture of a criminal somewhat resembling the late Jacques Dargis, that being Gradus. There it is. A throwaway comment, certainly not serving any purpose as far as the Zemblin story is concerned, but nevertheless reluctantly mentioned, for no other reason than because it must be the truth. Gradus, that cartoonish international villain and assassin, is suddenly presented with an alternative persona, a somewhat mundane criminal out for simple revenge, and aiming neither for Shade nor Kimboat, but for Goldsworth, the judge who sentenced him. Why then does he shoot Shade? Well, just as a resemblance reveals the true identity of Shade's killer, another resemblance unearths the reason for his death. Shade admits that he is said to resemble at least four people. Samuel Johnson, the lovingly reconstructed ancestor of a man in the Exton Museum, and two local characters, one being the slapdash dishevelled hag who ladles out the mash in the Leavenhall cafeteria. How interesting. He mentions two local characters, but names just one of them, some cafeteria worker at Wordsmith. Who might the other one be? I would rather say, remarked Mr. Pardon, American History, that she looks like Judge Goldsworth. So let's get this straight. Shade resembles this cafeteria worker, who herself resembles Judge Goldsworth. It's not hard to guess who the other local figure Shade is referring to is... Shade looks like Judge Goldsworth. Now his murder becomes easily understood. He wasn't hit by a stray bullet aimed at Charles Kimball, but deliberately shot at in a case of mistaken identity. Kimball's inability to make these connections and to avoid connecting everything to himself and his supposed past is then thrown sharply into light. If there exists this extremely credible explanation for the climactic murder described in Pale Fire, then we're probably led to doubt the existence of Zembla and Kimboat's position as royalty even more strongly. But now, before we get too comfortable in our solution that the editor of Pale Fire is simply not King Charles Xavier the Beloved, we have to look one layer deeper to realise that he isn't even Charles Kimboat. Well, not Dr. Kimboat. The point at which we start to doubt such a basic fact as the name of the commentator is surely going to be a point where we lose all hope of figuring out what's going on here. Aside from his implication of being Charles Xavier, there doesn't seem to be any other names we could associate with this person. Except there is. It's extremely uncommon for the index of a book to be crucial for understanding it. But even a quick look at the index of Pale Fire tells you that it too is the work of our troubled commentator. At first, it might just seem as if it's a collection of fun easter eggs. There's a treasure hunt that goes nowhere if you follow the reference from Crown Jewels. There's this random example of word golf. And of course, there's an enormous collection of 
sometimes hilariously eccentric names of Zemblin places and people. Highlights include Thurgus the Third and Gordon Cromholtz. The complete list of words in the index is as follows. If we're trying to peel away the fantasy and get to some inherent truth, one thing to consider is what's left when you remove all the words that are solely connected to the Zemblin narrative. Out of these, we have two real-life historical figures referenced by the commentator, images from Shade's poem, the game of word golf, the general terms, poems, translations, variants, religion, and suicide, and the main characters, the Shades, Kimboat, and Gradus. And then what's left? V. Botkin. Who's this V. Botkin? American scholar of Russian descent. Hmm. What's so important about this American scholar of Russian descent that our commentator gives him an index entry when, aside from the shades, none of the other characters from New Y, such as Emerald, Penin, Natushtag, or Hurley, get a mention? Despite being hidden away in this seemingly innocuous entry, this Botkin is the key to unwrapping the layers of deception in Pale Fire. Anyone reading Pale Fire for the first time is almost guaranteed to miss the very subtle references to him floating in and around the narrative, but they are most certainly there, and once we understand this mysterious figure, we can finally understand who it is that is talking to us, and what they are really trying to say. But first the specifics. The Botkin entry is unlike any of the others. First, all the references appear to be talking about things, not a person. Second, this is the only entry in the index where the page number references are in reverse order. They're mirrored, reflected, which ought to be ringing some bells. Is this Botkin a reflection of someone else? The other games we played in the index tell us that we might expect to be rewarded in some way for following references carefully, and if we follow the journey backwards through the text that the Botkin entry has mapped out for us, a clearer picture quickly emerges. We check the note to line 894 and find this conversation between Wordsmith faculty members. Professor Pardon now spoke to me. I was under the impression that you were born in Russia and that your name was kind of anagram of Botkin or Botkine. Professor Pardon thinks his name, Kinboat, is an anagram of Botkin. What a random thing to think, unless Pardon already knows that Kinboat is a constructed name constructed from a name that Pardon already knew previously. Let's check the note to line 247. Sybil Shade devises a creative insult, a king-sized botfly, a parasite, a shapeshifter, and an easy slur against someone with the name Botkin, so easily adapted to suggest kin of the botfly. Except the insult is hurled at Charles Kinbo. What about the note to line 71? Kimbo mentions Botkin in a list of names related to professions. Botkin, one who makes Botkin's fancy footwear. That wouldn't be particularly revealing on its own, although as Kimbo admits, there were indeed thousands of other surnames that could have been used as examples. Smith, Potter, Cooper, Mason, Taylor, or Taylor. Botkin doesn't seem like it'd be the first to come to mind. Unless the name had some meaning to you, perhaps. I mean, this is all very well, but where is the American scholar of Russian descent? We've seen plenty linking Kinboat to this name, but where is the person of Botkin actually mentioned? Ah, here. Speaking of the head of the bloated Russian department, Professor Penin, a regular martinet regard to his underlings. Happily, Professor Botkin, who taught in another department, was not subordinated to that grotesque perfectionist. This parenthetical is as good a proof as we could hope. There is indeed a Professor Botkin teaching at Wordsmith. He's not teaching in the Russian department, despite being a Russian. And Charles Kimball cares that Botkin is not subordinated to Professor Penin. We know that Penin is someone that Kimball personally despises. The only way that random thought, mm, isn't it great that Professor Botkin doesn't have to work for Professor Penin, can make any sense is if Botkin himself wrote it. We shouldn't be left in any doubt. Botkin is Kinboat, Kinboat is Botkin. Various odds and ends then fall into place. What's his real name? The V in Botkin. It's Vislav. It's right here. Charles II, 
Charles Xavier, the Slav, accidentally slipped by Botkin into his kingly pseudonym. Why does he randomly slip into Russian here and fall back on the Russian way of shortening someone's name? Because he is Russian. Our suspicions about him not being an exotic king from Zembla are vindicated. We have instead the deranged Professor Botkin, a Russian whose self-denial of his own identity explains the ridiculous counterpoint of Pale Fire. It's especially clear here. A list of languages, each pair linking English to another, starting with Zemblin but then cycling through nothing except the countries in the former Soviet sphere, and coming back again and again to the same pair, English and Russian, English and Russian, English and Russian, English and Russian. There we go then. The commentary of Pale Fire was written by Professor Vislav Botkin, a narcissistic, deluded Russian academic who dreamt up Zembla and all the connected stories. Puzzle solved. But hold up. If Zembla is all in Botkin's head, then why does Shade reference it in his poem? Is it just a humour, Botkin? Why is it genuinely mentioned in Pope's second epistle on the Essay of Man, just as Botkin claims? And why does Botkin seek to distinguish himself from some refugee from Nova Zembla? Because Zembla is actually a real place. Nova Zembla, to be precise, you can find it on Google Maps. Yep, it's that massive island off the coast of, surprise surprise, Russia. You can find it on Wikipedia too, and here's where it gets interesting. We get confirmation that Novia Zembla, Russian, New Land, is also known as Nova Zembla. And then we get told that the indigenous population existed from 1872 to the 1950s when it was resettled to the mainland. Resettled in the 1950s, right around when Pale Fire was set. Wonder why they resettled the population. It was the site of one of the two major nuclear test sites managed by the USSR, used for airdrops and underground testing of the largest Soviet nuclear bombs. Damn. Suddenly, the Zemblin fantasy takes on a bit more of a tragic spin. While Botkin tells stories about a glorious northern kingdom, the real-life Zembla has been evacuated, which explains the refugee reference, and it's being bombed into oblivion. So now that we've established what actually happens in the plot of Palefire, let's dig a little deeper into the main mystery remaining. Why does Botkin hide his true identity and life underneath his Zemblin story? Quite a few analyses have answered that with the simple explanation that Botkin is delusional. That's it. He's just mad. He picked the psychological short straw, tuck love for him I guess. I'm not going to have a go at anyone, because that's a perfectly clean way to put it, and may well be true. It could be the case that Botkin genuinely dissociates and has trouble distinguishing between Kinboat, Xavier and his true self. It's impossible for us to tell how much he truly believes at any given time, but there are definitely places in the novel where he seems unsure of which life is real. For example, let's look at this quote again. Particular countries aside, the repetition and switching back and forth could be interpreted as Botkin struggling to remember which languages he actually speaks or which one he teaches in. As well as this confusion, Botkin often expresses quite paranoid behaviour. Throughout his time at UI, he struggles to sleep when alone for fear of being murdered. While awake, he exists in a state of extreme distress, fear, paranoia and loneliness. Often, almost nightly, throughout the spring of 1959, I had feared for my life. Solitude is the playfield of Satan. I cannot describe the depths of my loneliness and distress. Suffice to say, this doesn't feel like the state of mind of a healthy person. If all this weren't enough, the population of UI seems to agree. As you'll see throughout this section, several residents call him mad to his face several times. However, what we're interested in is why Zembla? Why this delusion? It comes across as a fantasy for Botkin, the life he wishes he had. So what about it is a fantasy for him? Firstly, let's look at Zembla itself. The country of Zembla acts as a way for Botkin to come to terms with his conflicting ideas about Russia. Botkin is a Russian refugee in America, struggling to understand his national identity, 
As someone who fled to the other side of a Cold War, Botkin likely faces pressure to disassociate himself from Russia due to the surrounding anti-Russian sentiments. Yet he can't feel American. In such a patriotic climate as Cold War America, it must all be exhausting. He probably yearns to have that sense of belonging, but cannot feel proud of Soviet Russia. So we know why Botkin yearns for a homeland, a true place to belong, and Zembla gives him that. But there is a difference between having a home and ruling a kingdom, right? His American colleagues likely feel a huge sense of national pride without angling to become president. So in the Zemlin fantasy, why is Charles Xavier king? Well, for a start, having Zembla be a kingdom provides a sense of unity. A king is often a huge source of patriotism, someone at the core of that country. What better fantasy for an outsider than to imagine a country they can be proud of and serve to the extent of ruling it? But being a king also fulfills another desire of Botkin's, one which motivates many of his actions. That is, the desire to feel liked by people. There's a reason he crowned his alter ego, Charles, the Beloved, surrounded by loyalty and respect. There is no love for him in New Eye. The fact is that Botkin is openly hated and mocked by the vast majority of townspeople, including his fellow academics. A few examples. Your snicker, my dear Mrs. C, did not escape our notice. You are a remarkably disagreeable person. I fail to see how John and Sybil can stand you. I was you. not yet used to the rather fatiguing jesting and teasing. What's more, you're insane. Now, some of this dislike is inspired by things Botkin can't control, such as his nationality, delusions, and something else we'll touch on later. It's worth mentioning, though, that a fair amount of it can be purely attributed to his pretty dislikable personality, and that's basically on him. Unfortunately, however, the way Botkin responds to people antagonising him only serves to propagate these kind of encounters. There's a pattern in how he deals with it, which we can see when the examples are gathered side by side. In each of these cases, someone insults Botkin through some action or comment. He then proceeds to ignore them by spinning it so that he is superior in some way, often via throwing their intellect or integrity into question. This serves to save his feelings, but fuels his delusions and inflated ego, which in turn only make the townsfolk like him less. It's a vicious cycle, really. So based on all this, it's really no wonder why the Zembla fantasy appeals to Botkin. Not only does it remove him from this environment of suspicion and disgust, it also feeds into his own ego and narcissism. The people who insult him only do so because they don't know how important he really is. Moving on from Zembla, Let's take a look at this third example again, because there's something else interesting here. Notice how Botkin separates John Shade from the other academics. He isn't one of the inbreeding, grinning old males. Botkin regards him as being on the same level. We know that Botkin has a track record of exaggerating his relationship with Shade, but let's take a deeper look into that. Is John actually any different from the others when it comes to how he treats his neighbour? Actually, yes, he is. Not nearly to the extent Botkin would have us believe, but enough to earn our sympathies for trying. All of the town are aware that Botkin is deluded, but whereas many of the others treat him with contempt, Shade pities him. He's one of the few who are slightly nice to Botkin, putting up with him coming on walks and listening to his self-centred rambles. Sure, there's still a little sarcasm there, a little poking fun, but it comes across as much more friendly than the outright mockery from the other staff members, the mockery that Shade refuses to partake in, at least in front of Botkin. And Shade also compliments and humours his eccentricity. He plays along, and at one point sort of defends Botkin via diffusing the newspaper situation when it becomes too heated. No, no, said Shade. I'm sure, Charles, our young friend never intended to insult your sovereign and namesake. These simple courtesies are all it takes for Botkin's mind to grow near nothing into a beautiful friendship. However, Botkin's investment in Shade goes beyond even simple friendship. It quickly borders on obsession. He openly writes about spying on their house, to the extent that he's able to relate minute details of the couple's everyday routine. Then there's this little escapade, where upon hearing that the Shades are going on holiday, he, without hesitation, rents out a holiday cabin next to theirs just so he can be near them at all times. Is there another angle to this that we are missing? Indeed there is. At least, there is another aspect of Botkin's character we have yet to mention, which may go some way towards explaining why he obsesses and fawns over Shade to the degree that he does. That being, Botkin is homosexual. 
This is made exceptionally evident within the text, and so I say it with a very high level of confidence, but it should be noted that Botkin never technically addresses his sexuality directly. Like his Russian nationality, it's another thing he represses from society, the reader, and perhaps even himself to a certain degree. Which, to be fair, makes sense given that Pale Fire the novel was set and published during a time when homosexual relations were still illegal in America. Because of this, readers can perhaps be forgiven for not immediately clocking all the subtext, etc. But once it clicks, it's impossible to then not notice every instance where Botkin uses an interesting adjective or mentions a young male friend of his offhandedly. The evidence just keeps coming. The point at which it becomes undeniable arrives early in the Zemblin narrative, when Botkin, speaking as Charles Xavier, talks about his sheltered friend, Oleg. Both lads were handsome, long-legged specimens of Varangian boyhood. At 12, Oleg was the best centre-forward at the Duckle School, when stripped and shiny in the midst of the battle. And if that, by some strange miracle, isn't enough to convince you, the next page just every confirms that they had sex. Less than a fortnight had passed since Oleg's last visit, when for the first time the two boys had been allowed to share the same bed. So, yeah. Who knows whether this encounter was inspired by actual events, or is merely what Botkin wished had happened. Either way, we can add this to the list of what Botkin gets out of the Zemba fantasy. It allows him to explore and express that side of himself more freely, since it's within the confines of a fake identity. There's another interesting thing to point out in relation to Botkin's sexuality. Remember that pattern we discussed earlier of how Botkin responds to people making fun of him? Well, there are a couple of instances in which this changes slightly. Most of the time, he seems to internally criticise the person in question, but refrains from actually responding verbally, choosing instead to outwardly ignore their comments. However, upon hearing a certain kind of remark, he tends to react more impulsively, actively lashing out. And these remarks don't seem like the worst insults he's faced either, at least not at first. For example, one time he happens to overhear someone refer to him as the Great Beaver and pettily pulls their bow tie loose. The most startling interaction though is when a man calling him a fancy pansy seems to elicit genuine rage. Why is that? Well, as it happens, both these instances of Botkin cracking his haughty exterior occur when someone insinuates that he is gay. Beaver and pansy are both derogatory slang terms associated with gay men. In the beaver instance, he makes sure to justify to the reader another reason why he might be called that, so you can continue to conceal the truth from his theoretically 1950s American readers. Additionally, these incidents give evidence that all his co-workers know about his homosexuality, just as they are aware of his delusions, and that may be yet another reason for them to dislike or mistrust him. But anyway, going back to Botkin and Shade now. Could Botkin be harbouring some unrequited romantic feelings for Shade? Well, the way he talks about John certainly seems a little beyond simple admiration. My admiration for him was for me a sort of alpine cure. I experienced a grand sense of wonder whenever I looked at him, especially in the presence of other people. Inferior people. However, the small, unhealthy obsession aspect means it's really hard to say what exactly would be a normal relationship for Botkin. Additionally, there is actually decent evidence against him being sexually attracted to Shade. This quote in particular stands out. My sublime neighbour's face had something about it that might have appealed to the eye, had it only been Leonine or only Eroquian. But unfortunately, by combining the two, it merely reminded one of a fleshy Hogarthian tippler of indeterminate sex. His misshapen body, that grey mop of abundant hair, the yellow nails of his pudgy fingers, the bags under his lustreless eyes, were only intelligible if regarded as the waste products eliminated from his intrinsic self by the same forces of perfection which purified and chiselled his verse. He was his own cancellation. That doesn't mean he couldn't still have a romantic attraction, of course. But given all we know about Botkin, I would wager that something else is going on. It is important to take into account that, despite watching him carefully and attempting to spend as much time with him as possible, 
Botkin never actually shows any interest whatsoever in Shade's personal life, ambitions, deep thoughts, anything. He seems to be more attached to Shade by pure virtue of him being a poet, instead of actually trying to get to know him. In fact, in a few instances, Botkin appears to impose on Shade his own romantic ideal of what a poet should be, despite the reality of who Shade is. A real poet would never read a tabloid newspaper, but Shade does. He also looks dishevelled, and is not completely immune to teasing Botkin, just as the inbreeding old males do. But Kinbo disregards these attributes. Botkin evidently has a huge respect for writers and literature as a whole, but perhaps Botkin's true motives for getting close to Shade are more selfish than simple admiration. When they discuss poetry, Botkin always finds a way of bringing it back to Zembla. He so desperately wants Shade to write down Charles's life, to include some part of him in this great new work. So why might that be? Does he think it would make his fantasy more real? This entire relationship with Shade could actually be more about Botkin seeking validation again by acting as inspiration for the poem. If a great poet acknowledges Botkin's thoughts, it's like telling him that what he thinks about matters. Additionally, Botkin wants to live vicariously through Shade. By giving inspiration to Shade's poem, he will have had an impact on literature that he would never have been able to otherwise. In the Zembla narrative, Charles Xavier is passionately addicted to the study of literature. So much so that he would like nothing more than to retire his kingly duties in favour of lecturing, which he actually gets to do upon reaching the US. Thus, it's clear that this is what Botkin also desires. However, in reality, he seems to teach in some kind of Slavic language department. So you can tell he's not too pleased about that. He calls the literature course a ridiculous mediocrity, once again taking out his disappointment and pain by putting down the intelligence of others. Perhaps he did teach literature in Russia, but this is all he could get here. Or maybe they simply think him inadequate. The reaction of the English professors to Botkin editing the Pale Fire manuscript would certainly suggest the latter, and that would also drive him even more to control everything about this whole process. To summarise then, Botkin, due to his idealisation of what a poet or sophisticated person ought to be, seems to have managed to end up romantically obsessed with the idea of Shade, as opposed to the man himself, since he doesn't really know him and finds him physically unattractive. He convinces himself that Shade likes him almost as much after the latter shows him a small amount of kindness and pity and comes to rely on this imaginary friendship, using it to give himself something to hold on to. It allows him to reject what everyone else says about him, because what do their opinions matter, so long as Shade is on his side? If the great John Shade, a wondrous poet and Botkin's best friend, respects him as much as one would respect Charles Xavier the Beloved, then surely that's enough. Whatever was thought, whatever was said, I had my full reward in John's friendship. Their wishful friendship is really the only good thing that Botkin has, which makes the lack of affection on Shade's end rather tragic. So then, this leaves us with two key questions. What happens when Shade dies? And what happens when Botkin reads Pale Fire? When he realises that Shade didn't include Zembla, and that he never thought of Charles as any more than some neighbour. What happens when Botkin reads this? This quote is pretty easy to overlook at first. After all, Pale Fire has some lines which are much more complex, with wordplay that Nabokov specifically designed to trip up readers and mess with their heads. This is very straightforward by comparison, except for that strange dash. We have at least one clue from Botkin, pointing out that the missing name has two syllables, but that's hardly much to go on. What does Swift and Baudelaire have in common? Swift and Baudelaire both went mad. So could it be Kinboat? Or perhaps Botkin? See, the thing is, nobody actually knows whether this word is supposed to be pronounced Kinboat or Kinbote, and it could be either. We don't have any verbal recordings of Nabokov saying his name, but Botkin is definitely a trochee, and the alliteration makes it the more poetic choice. Per old man Swift, per Botkin, per Baudelaire. So that's very neat. Either way, Shade was likely going to add our commentator to the list, but decided to leave it out because he knew Botkin would read it. And now he has. Botkin really had thought that this poem would be an ode to Zembla. After placing all these hopes onto Shade for nothing, Botkin has a perfectly normal reaction. Dismay, at first, then denial. 
He starts to read into the poem. It has to be about him. Otherwise, he has to face the truth that he was completely insignificant to this man, this symbol of who he wants to be. So thus we get the pale fire commentary that we just finished, where he strives to convince us, the reader, that he was important to Shade. So, putting together all these pieces for a minute, the picture we build is that of a man who is totally and completely alone. He feels out of place in a country far from his now unreachable home, in a job he dislikes, surrounded by people who hate him, and after all that, the one man who treats him with kindness, his idol, is murdered in front of him for no reason at all. And then even worse, he finds out that he never even cared about him in the first place. The deeper you look, Botkin seems like more and more of a tragic character. But let's not get too carried away here and forget that he has a lot more than one fatal flaw. He still stalks Shade, pressured his grieving widow into giving up her husband's last work, is incredibly rude and arrogant to nearly everyone, and is currently having this existential crisis while in hiding. If he had a shred of self-awareness about any of that, then maybe he'd get more sympathy. But sadly, it seems like that's never going to happen. Except, on the very last page of the index, Botkin does something unexpected. He gives up. Possible allusion to K. Towards the end of the commentary, Botkin acknowledges that Pilfer has nothing to do with Zembla, and soon after, he outright admits to adding the Zembla variations himself. I wish to say something about an earlier note to line 12. Conscience and scholarship have debated the question, and I now think the two lines given in that note are distorted and tainted by wishful thinking. It is the only time in the course of the writing of these difficult comments that I have tarried in my distress and disappointment on the brink of falsification. I must ask the reader to ignore those two lines, which I am afraid do not even scan properly. I could strike them out before publication, but that would mean reworking the entire note, or at least a considerable part of it, and I have no time for such stupidities. It seems as though Botkin's period of denial is over now. This line can easily be read as him admitting that he has indeed gone mad, letting go of Zembla after clinging to it for so long. He might also be letting go of the illusion of his great relationship with Shade, realising here that Shade only ever really pitied him, which is pretty tragic. This adds to a rather popular theory among academics, the Botkin commits suicide before finishing this book. At this point in the commentary, it already feels like he has given up on his fantasy of ever being seen as more than Botkin, the mad, bad and possibly dangerous. But giving up becomes literal when you get to the end of the index and realise that it's not complete. Look at the entry for Zembla. There's nothing. Knowing Botkin up to now, this should have by far the most references, but he just leaves it here. This can be put in the context of his apology to suicide from page 174, as well as this quote. But whatever happens, wherever the scene is laid, somebody, somewhere, will quietly set out. Somebody has already set out. Someone still rather far away is buying a ticket, is boarding a bus, a ship, a plane, has landed, is walking towards a million photographers, and presently he will ring at my door, a bigger, more respectable, more competent Gradus. It seems like no matter what, Botkin doesn't see himself having much of a future. Who might this more competent Gradus, this harbinger of death, be? If this was still Xavier talking, in his endless paranoia, the answer would be obvious. But by this point, Botkin has admitted that he isn't Xavier. So who, or what? does that leave? We'll never really know, but we suspect the Botkin's final ending is not a happy one, and given the essentially tragic set of circumstances he's lived through, perhaps that's not as deserved as we might have first thought. We've given you what we hope is a satisfying solution to the puzzle of Pale Fire. It explains the eccentricities and deceptions in a way which makes sense and hopefully demonstrates how Pale Fire isn't really a parody, nor a murder mystery, but a character study and a tragedy. We of course should give credit to Mary McCarthy 
whose essay A Bolt from the Blue was the first to spell out the basic facts about Botkin and the truth of his delusions. But as compelling as this explanation may be, it's not necessarily the only solution you might arrive at. What if, for example, there was no John Shade, and he, as well as his poem, was concocted by Botkin Kimboat? What if there was no Botkin or Kimboat, and the forward and commentary are both the works of Shade himself, who did not die, but wrote his own death into the narrative? What if the ghost of Hazel Shade, Shade's unfortunate daughter, has a significant role in what's playing out, and in fact there's something far more supernatural going on? This might all seem a bit far-fetched. Do we sit here and become like Botkin, desperately reading layers of our own projected meaning into a text where it just doesn't have it? Maybe so, but that doesn't change the fact that academics have given lectures and published papers endorsing all of these ideas. There is no universal scholarly consensus on the truth of Pale Fire. After all, it is in some ways still a novel, and the only true truth is that the whole thing was written in 1961 by Vladimir Nabokov. The genius is in injecting enough subtlety into the narrative that the debate is forced to deal with the first level of the story, what actually happened, just as much as it has to deal with secondary levels such as symbolism and allegory as with other novels. More than that, the experience of reading Pale Fire, the way in which facts reveal themselves to us, and the final conclusion we eventually arrive at, is entirely dependent on the decisions we make as readers as we read. Literally everywhere in Pale Fire, we have to decide, do I follow this reference, look this thing up, cross-check this assertion? It's deliberately designed so that certain seemingly innocuous facts placed earlier in the narrative only take on fuller significance when you caught on to something presented later. If you just read it straight through, start to finish, then put it down and get on with your life, your final conclusion will probably be something like, eh? And yeah, the one star reviews on Goodreads are evidence that this is certainly the place where some people end up. You have to mess about, you've got to play with it in some sense. This is why, we reckon, you can view Pale Fire as an establishing work in a genre that didn't even exist when it was written. Hyperfiction. Think about it. Following links, non-linear narratives, active reader involvement. It's an exact precursor to a way of reading that completely dominates how we consume media today. There are other books that are somewhat self-referential in this way. They contain narratives that refer to themselves, and are made self-aware by acknowledging the fact that the narrative can exist in a form beyond the medium of presentation. If you'd like some recommendations, House of Leaves, If on a Winter's Night a Traveller, S, that's also called The Ship of Theseus, and Godel Escher Bach. But this idea isn't by definition super highbrow. At its most basic level, you'll probably remember those sorts of choose-your-own-adventure stories, where you can decide what happens next by going to page X. And of course, the internet takes this further. You can read all kinds of interesting fiction online now that is cultivated through intertwining hyperlinked narratives. Have a look at the SCP Foundation if you haven't come across that already. Then, to take the same concept further still, taking hyperfiction to its furthest degree, we basically end up with video games, and I'm including adventure games, RPGs, visual novels in that catch-all term. Pale Fire shows us that incredibly deep, exciting, self-referential hyper-stories can be constructed with very limited means, and this is great news for video game designers and the next generation of literature. Unfortunately, there's a bit of a perception among certain literary and academic communities that video games are somehow childish, or at least lowbrow as far as literature is concerned. But this is the same community that considers Pale Fire to be somehow the highest of highbrow literature. We create a massive disconnect when we put things into boxes like this. Being an active participant is a natural way to experience stories. There's so much potential to develop artistic conception of narrative through computer media, actual digital literature. We can take inspiration from Pale Fire and from existing metafictional narratives and construct all kinds of new worlds. There's barely any limit to the amazing diversity of puzzles we can create now. With a bit of ingenuity, we might be building our own Zemblin kingdoms. Thank you.
ser 